Welcome to the Biz Bash podcast, where we make biz strategy a piece of cake. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Cammie, but you might know us better as Eliza and Calligraphy and Cammie Monet. We want to help you, our fellow stationers, artists, and calligraphers, confidently build a profitable and personality-driven creative biz. We're here to share our honest-to-goodness advice and actionable strategies for ambitious artists. So put on your party hat, quit being a procrastinator gator, and let's get this party started. Hey guys, welcome back to the Biz Birthday Bash podcast. We have two very special guests today. We are talking with Megan and Cedar Watson, the owners of Paper Goat Post. And today we're talking to them about how to open a brick and mortar stationery shop and getting all the inside scoop on what that looks like, get some inside advice on what it looks like to actually shop for other people's products working on inventory, what they look for when they're buying things. So it's going to be really good if you're interested in starting to wholesale. So let me just tell you a little bit about Megan and Cedar. Um, Well, they're twins, first of all. So it's going to be really hard to tell them apart just by their voice on the podcast too. (laughs) They have 20 plus years of combined event industry experience, and they wanted to merge their love of events with their paper loving roots to create a shop experience that could share in Orlando and beyond. So yes, they are local to me, which I love. Um, It's always been their dream to create a space where they could cultivate a love for paper and party. So Megan and Cedar truly believe there's something to celebrate every day with a little or a lot of paper. I am feeling this, you guys. We are like kindred here. <laughs> <laughs> and through Paper Go Post, they strive to promote togetherness with their Paper Go Post philosophies, the lost art of snail mail, gathering and celebration, and the thoughtful art of giving. Just the best, you guys. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. We're excited to be here. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So I know I gave like a huge introduction about you guys. And obviously, everyone knows you guys are local to me too. So it's like, we already have this relationship going and you're one of my stockers, so my stuff is in your store. So it's very cool. But tell us our audience a little bit more of how the idea of opening a store came to be like what actually sparked the creation of Paper Goat Post? Yes. So this is Megan. So you can try to differentiate our voices as we go through this. Um, But I will give you a little backstory of the shop. Um, We had tons of event experience and really have always wanted to open a shop from when we were little. We just um, that was kind of our thing that we wanted to own a shop of some sort. We had no idea what it was actually going to have inside the shop, but we just thought it would be fun to do. And I remember as like a little kid kind of brainstorming like displays, like we loved going to a local shop by us that had a gift wrapping area. And so we always wanted to have um, that service for our customers and just some things that we've gravitated towards over the years. Our mom loves stationery and writing thank yous and um, just that, you know, art of corresponding in a more formal way um, is something that we grew up with. So it was kind of just like in our blood. And after years of being in the event industry, doing huge corporate events, um, we did grand openings. We both worked at Universal Orlando and their event and production department for years before we actually opened the shop. Um, so, you know, we opened uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and did all those big, huge events, but we were kind of at a point in our career where we're like, what's next? And we had brainstormed about things. And then we kind of stumbled upon a location and fast tracked to let's make our dream a reality. So I'd like to say it was something we'd always had hoped for. And we knew um, Universal was a great company to work for. So we knew we were either going to leave there um, to work for ourselves or stay there. So it wasn't really an option to go to a different um, corporate company. We would want to we wanted to work for ourselves. Yeah. So um, I love that. And I love that you guys already have that event experience to back it up because it definitely should. I didn't even know that about y'all. It definitely shows <laughs> through with the, just the caliber of everything you do at your shop and all the workshops and all the, the parties you guys host. I mean, it's very cool. So um, what are some of the first steps that you took to begin the process once you were like, okay, uh, we do want to open a brick and mortar space. Um, can you let us know some of those first steps you took? Yeah, so we um, kind of this, did this a little more. This is Cedar now, by the way. Um, <laughs> so we we're gonna kind of alternate uh, with questions, but we Love it. we kind of did this a little more untraditionally. We, as we always wanted to open a shop um, in the future, we thought it was more of like a five ten year plan. But we 
stumbled across the location, um, Swanson's Ivanhoe Row, where we're located in downtown or just north of downtown Orlando. And of course, we did the thing where, you know, you see a house kind of like a real estate market, you see a house and you're like, how much is it? And you start going to an open house that you don't even need to buy a house. Mm-hmm. So we kind of did that with our first location. We saw a for lease sign, called the landlord and said, how much is it? And then he asked us <laughs> to come with our business plan and tell him our ideas to him and see what, what he thought. So that kind of jump started all of our thoughts and our plannings over the years. And we sat down that weekend after calling them and made a little one sheet, a little quick because business we, plan. <laughs> we definitely did not have a business plan altogether. <laughs> we quickly threw something together. We yeah. knew it was stationary and perhaps party and that's about it. We drafted our very first logo um, overnight and put together a little business plan on one sheet. Turns out that our landlord also loves paper um, and was super thrilled about our ideas and actually shared a different location with us. So our very first location um, was not the one that we called and inquired about, but he shared that location with us and thought that it would be a great fit. So we went back to the drawing board and ultimately we calculated the risk and what it would take to open and what we would lose if we went forward and signed a lease and acted on the location This was in February and we had until November is when the space would be open. So we had, you know, a good portion of the year to really figure things out. So we calculated, you know, if November comes and we're not ready and this isn't what we want to do, what are we losing? um, And are we willing to take that risk at that point? So we decided we were willing to take the risk. And then we really dove into planning, coming up exactly what our brand was going to be, what our mix was going to be, putting a more solid business plan on paper. And we really used that time, which I think was key to our success at the beginning. We really used that gap of time um, from when we signed the lease to opening to build brand awareness in the city. We partner with a lot of local folks, some other podcasts and kind of creative groups um, to build our brand awareness and build the hype of what was coming to Orlando. So I think that really helped at the very beginning as well. And although we kind of did it backwards, we definitely think that, you know, in hindsight, that really diving into what your customer is and what gap you're filling um, in that location is really key to finding out and if it's going to be successful for you and if it's worth it for you to open or start diving into a brick and mortar business. I was going to say nothing to light the fire under you, like knowing you're going to be paying for a lease. (laughs) Yes, Yes. exactly. And come with that, you know, that's one of your first things, you know, like there's going to be money involved. So um, we really got a little nerdy about our numbers and started crunching numbers, making sure we knew exactly kind of what our break even point was. And and from that day forward, we stayed super involved in our numbers of our business because that is the backbone of, you know, what making it actually be successful for both of us. And I think similarly to what you guys have recommended when you guys first started, you really need to crunch your own numbers of what you need to bring home. Um, we knew we were going in this together, so we are going to kind of lean on each other and I, Cedar, just was the first one to leave Universal um, to open the shop and Megan stayed full time um, for quite a few years after just to help with that kind of income flow. So you really need to do your own numbers and know what you want to bring home and what you want to get out of the business um, to make it feel right and successful Mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy that you guys ended up actually leaving Universal at different times, but totally makes sense because I was going to follow up and ask yeah. about that actually, <laughs> like when you all left. So at what point then did you feel comfortable? You said Megan left second, right? I did. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, how did you know that you reached the point that you were comfortable that both of you guys could be full time? Yeah. Well, we kind of grew and this is kind of getting into some of the numbers, but when we first opened the business, I was not taking much home. Um, This is Cedar. um, And I was not taking much home as far as income goes and was really relying on Megan at the time for, you know, bills and cell phone, all those things, all the fun things, uh, which was fantastic. 
And then as the business grew and I was able to take a little bit more home, then we kind of got to a point where it made sense that Megan was also going to leave. Um, She also got pregnant. So that (laughs) kind of threw a a wrench into things as well. Um, So uh, Kate was on her way. So that kind of sped up things for Megan to leave as well. But I was really at the point where the business paper goat post wasn't going to grow unless we were both working on it more full time. Um, We were kind of at a just a coasting point where we needed to have that second person to really move forward with some of our projects and growing. Yeah. And say Cedar stayed very involved in like the operations and running it day to day. And she still is more of that key person. Um, but as your business grows, there's more back end projects that need to be done. So um, me leaving Universal allowed me to do some of that at off odd hours and, you know, not in the day to day, which really, I think, helps propel paper go post into the next level. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also I have to say too, like in terms of finding a space, I'm so surprised, I guess. And I love that you were able to do this, that they loved the idea of having a store like you in the area. So that was part of the reason they wanted to support you guys. But I've heard stories where like people will ask for like three years of like business finances and stuff like that. So how cool that you were able to like essentially pitch a brand new business idea to them. And like, are you guys still in the same space today? We are close. We are two, two doors down. So okay. our uh, building is a little row of um, retail shops on the bottom. And then there's like more offices upstairs, but it's like an historic old building um, that was an antique row back in the day. And our fa- the, our landlord's family has owned the building. So each unit kind of has character and different sizes and they're all different. So we were two about two doors down. Um, and then after our first year of being opened, we uh, the space where we are currently, which was much larger, um, became available. And it had a little party room that we have, which we'll probably talk about a little later. But we have this now space that we can really hone in on our workshops and rent it out for small parties. Um, so that was just like a huge asset to moving down the row a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. Yes. So when you were like considering picking the location, I know you kind of just were calling being like, do you have availability and like the open (laughs) house thing? Because I I love that because I love going to open houses. Um, Were you looking more for like the cost overall, like the overall cost of it or like weighing in factors like foot traffic or what were some of the things where you're like, okay, it needs to have this, this and this. (laughs) Right. We really, it was I mean, it's always a little bit about price of what it's worth and the value of it. But ultimately, we really, when we found the space, and if you've ever been in our shop, um, it really complemented our brand and just like the vision that we had for our shop and the feel that our customers would get when they walked into the store. It doesn't feel like you're walking into like a strip mall, just a bay, an open bay, um, which people have done really awesome things with those type of spaces. But for our brand specifically and kind of that traditional feel of stationary, it just really, um, it just really screamed our name yeah. and we fell in love with it and uh, people, thought it was an asset to our brand for sure. People will ask us to you, like, does this what your house feels like? And, you know, we actually can say kind of like, yes, it is. <laughs> it's a lot of wood, black and white with pops of color. And that is both of our houses for the most part as well. So we wanted it to feel comfortable and homey and have really unique details. The party room has a tin ceiling and we have these crazy brass like door hinges hinges that are awesome that people just notice. So it's like layers and layers of things for people to look at and um, spark their interest as they come and experience the shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of where our event background comes in where, you know, we created experiences our whole career. So our shop was more Um, more than just about the products. It was about the experience of how they're feeling when they're coming in, going through the whole process of checking out and leaving. Um, So that was kind of our our vibes. (laughs) No, and I think you guys really nailed it because it is super freaking cute. Like the the door (laughs) handles that are like the writing 
yeah. or whatever. <laughs> like oh my quill, gosh. Yeah. yeah, the quill, it gets me every single time. But, you know, <laughs> as, as creatives, we all kind of like nerd out over that like atmosphere and feeling over things. But I think it yes. really does contribute to like the success of a of a business. Like I th- you think about restaurants that just have like good food, but there's like no experience for atmosphere. It's like, meh. But like you mm-hmm. guys captured yeah. that in such a perfect way and that space really captures it too. So I think that's, that was just a really, really smart move on, y- on y'all's part to not have that like, I don't know, standard kind of strip mall feel. It has that, it has that experience element to it. And that's really important when you're shopping for cute little things. So yeah, <laughs> yes, so that's why we go shopping, right? For the <laughs> yes. <laughs> you want that experience for sure. <laughs> Perfect. All right, everyone, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back right after this. Hey, guys, we just wanted to hop in and talk about one of our amazing resources, the A to Z directory. All of us have thought at some point, how did she do that or how did she make that? And maybe you don't know where to start or how the heck to produce this amazing product you've dreamt up. Well, the A to Z directory is the missing puzzle piece in your biz, you guys, seriously. So it's built in the form of a yearly membership, and it's your one-stop shop for finding suppliers and vendors for all the things. Literally where to print everything from custom invitations, greeting cards, mugs, koozies, acrylic printing, letterpress, custom ribbon. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and it literally goes from A to Z. From acrylic printers to zipper pouches, we have it in the A to Z directory. We want to help all of you search less and create more with this list of 300 plus vendors and suppliers. Don't worry, they're very organized. It's not going to be overwhelming and confusing when you join. And this membership also includes access to a private Facebook community. It's incredibly active and involved. And if you need a question answered fast, that is definitely the place to go. Yeah, our Facebook group really is the best, you guys. Everyone is so helpful in there. And we're in there too, um, answering questions you guys might have. So it's a great way to get access to us and ask us things without sliding into our dms so we're more likely to answer you in the facebook group just saying anyway (laughs) also in the facebook group this is new for 2020 and we're really excited about it we are hosting monthly power hour q a sessions that are live and these are only available to our a to z directory members so you can hop in with us live and ask us all your burning questions in real time and just hang out with us every month And we do these at different times so you can actually be there live and the replays are always available in the Facebook group for members. This resource is priced at $147 a year, which honestly is extremely affordable and it's full of so many benefits such as exclusive vendor coupons for members only. And we would love to have you guys join. Seriously, it's kind of like our family and our tribe. So visit bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash directory to sign up today and use coupon code podcast. 2020 to receive $20 off your first year. That's podcast, all caps, 2020 for $20 off your first year. We can't wait to see you in the Facebook group. All right, we're going to dive into talking about inventory. Cami, why don't you go ahead and take it away? I feel like you have much more of a concept of inventory than I do. <laughs> Okay. Well, I just like, but like, I always think about, you know, I've had a dream of opening a shop one day too. And I'm just like, Oh, it'd be really cool. But you know, there's all these things you get hung up on. And one of the things that I totally get hung up on is ordering inventory and ordering a bunch of product. And like first starting out, I just want to know like what that looked like for you guys and how you even decided what type of inventory to bring in when you, I mean, I know you spent a ton of time like working on your brand, but what did that process look like in terms of bringing an actual product? Yeah, so this was probably, I wouldn't say the most fun, but it was definitely, (laughs) and it still is um, one of our highlights when we get to sit down and like pick out inventory and new things to bring to the shop. Um, So it was definitely a fun process at the beginning and it got us all giddy about (laughs) opening a shop. But we, pretty early on, because we had that time window, timing just worked out great um, that the National Stationery Show, which I know is a, a lot of stationaries, a stationaries uh, dream to go to, um, that show was coming up. So we, that's like a buying show where a lot of wholesalers are all representing their own brand. So we got to go, we booked our tickets and went up there for the stationery show. So that's really how we found a lot of our paper brands and um, small makers that were not local to Orlando or the Florida area. Um, So we really got to just go, we had a little bit of a budget of what we were going to spend when we went up there and just wrote a ton of orders of things we loved 
I'll backtrack a little bit. We did do a lot of the branding stuff before we um, went up there and before we like at the beginning process of building the store. So we knew our philosophies. So the uh, lost art of sale mail gathering and celebration and the thoughtful art of giving. So every time into this day, every time we make a purchase on what we put in the store, it has to relate back to one of those philosophies. So if it doesn't fit that, it's just not really our type of products. So it may not be in an industry, like it may be a beauty product, but it says something celebratory on it or writing related, then it's something that we consider for the shop. So we just kind of had that in the back of our minds when we were shopping and started getting everything in. And then when it started arriving, we um, started to look at what we had in the store. Um, We, unlike some of the other stores, in that are stationary stores that are stationary years that open stores, like say a cami, if you opened a store, you'd have a lot of product already to be able to put into it. But we, we didn't have that. Our, our custom design stuff is all invitations and stationary, not so much the actual physical products. So we were looking for products that complemented um, what we had to offer in the store. Um, and we kind of adjusted our product mix over the years to just kind of reevaluate who our customer was and what gaps we were missing and kind of uh, f- we were filling for the Orlando market in our local community. So we just kind of pivoted as we went along the buying process. But yeah, I wouldn't oh say that gosh. we <laughs> have mastered it yet. Like we still we still are iffy on like, okay, what are we spending and projecting for future? Um, it, it's definitely a long learning curve. We we told the first person we showed our business plan that when he asked what our experience was, we said, well, we like to shop. So we know how to, we know how to shop. We just haven't had a shop. So, uh, oh my so that was gosh, our experience. Yes. So we just kind of, he didn't like that answer. He didn't like that answer at all, but, but it, it gave us the know that we needed to be more driven to make it successful. <laughs> Do you guys have any? Yes. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine. How fun. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Elizabeth. <laughs> I was going to say, do you guys have any systems and things that help you manage inventory and help you manage your numbers that you love that you'd be willing to share? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we use Square for just about everything, (laughs) including (laughs) payroll, time cards, inventory. It's a little bit more, I think when you really dive into the numbers, it might be a little bit more pricey than some systems that are out there. But as we all know, if any of you guys use it, it's so user-friendly. I mean, I do payroll from my phone, sometimes in bed in the morning in like five minutes and, you know, things like that and systems like that for inventory and tracking has been really helpful and not needing to learn like a whole new process and system. Like it's stuff that we're all pretty familiar with. And, you know, we've either bought something on Square or using Square and it's about the same when you're on the business side using it as well, as far as like learning curve. So I would say that's great. We also use Dubsado for, (laughs) we do, we love it as well. I know you guys are huge fans. Um, We are also huge fans. That was a game changer a few years ago. Um, I think, Cammie, we probably saw it from you, honestly. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I think I remember talking about it. (laughs) Yes, um, it truly was a game changer in how quickly we could turn around our invitation and like personal stationary side, all of our custom work and track some of that. And we also use Dubsado for some of our events, their proposals that you can kind of set up and then people buy things right from the proposals. We kind of use it on the back end for some of our events, some of our Halloween parties that are out right now. If you are on our website and you click our Halloween party, that's a Dubsado form and it allows people to book and plan a little party in our studio. So we really love it and use it for all sorts of different things. And we can definitely probably do a whole episode in <laughs> how to use Dubsado um, for a brick and mortar shop and some of those different avenues that you wouldn't even think of, but it's fantastic. <laughs> I love that you said that because we just spent an hour yesterday talking about how to use Dubsado for stationers. And I honestly feel like we could have an entire like <gasps> Dubsado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we will let you guys yeah, know. So great. <laughs> it is great. If you guys want to come back to like do that at some point, we would absolutely love that. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure I um, ordered when I ordered a Billy balloon one time for our for our Biz Birthday Bash webinar we did. I think I, you had a Dubsado form that I ordered through. I'm pretty sure yes. if I remember yes. correctly. It, 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 <laughs> yes, it's morphed a little bit. Yes, we definitely have. Oh my gosh! And I just have to say while we're on the topic of the Billy balloons because I made my husband Alex go pick them up. <laughs> he thought it was like going to be like a normal balloon size, and he was so confused how big it was. He was like, "What the heck? This thing is massive! Like you didn't." <laughs> It's our favorite when Every the husbands all come in and pick up orders. They're like, oh my gosh, what did what <laughs> did I get wrapped into? <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> I want to backpedal real quick too because I love something that you guys mentioned. And you had mentioned, we use Square. We really love it. We know we might be able to find something, you know, like cheaper, but this is what we love. And I just want to encourage listeners out there. I think that is honestly the perfect mindset to have because once you find something that's like magic and works for you and works within your margins, like why shop around for something cheaper, quote unquote, that you might not understand yeah, better, for sure. if that makes sense. Um because I remember thinking the same thing yesterday because I totally got reeled in by like an mm-hmm. ad for some platform that does payroll. And I was like looking at the prices for it. And I was like, oh, could we, you know, for Biz Birthday Bash, could we cut some money here? Could we save some money here? And then I was like, no, you know what? This isn't even, this isn't worth it. This is not <laughs> worth my sanity <laughs> to try to like reset up a brand new system when we have one in place that's been working really great, that we like the customer service. Like maybe we pay a little more for it, you know, but Like, I think that's worth it. So what's cheap is not always what's best. That's for sure. So I love that you guys have stood by that. It's definitely true. Correct. (laughs) And that's great advice, too, for someone who's considering opening a brick and mortar location. It's just that mentality of, you know, why are you opening a shop? Like, we wanted to open it so that we had the freedom and the creative freedom and also like our lifestyle freedom to open the shop. So if it's something's easier, but a little more expensive, it definitely was to us is worth it so that we can have that time outside of the shop life um, to do things. So that is, yeah, such a great point. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about a little bit are some unexpected changes. <laughs> challenges. <laughs> challenges. <laughs> COVID. Cough, cough. Um, yes. <laughs> unexpected changes and challenges. Honestly, challenges and changes honestly are kind of exactly the same thing to me in certain contexts. So unexpected challenges that you guys have faced this year. Um, we'll let you take it away to share with us what this year has kind of looked like for you guys. Yeah. So, you know, we got the questions ahead of time and we were really kind of thinking about this one as well. And we've definitely hit challenges along the way and things that needed to change over the five years that we've been open. Um, And we, although we are going to talk a tiny bit about COVID, um, we wanted to kind of suggest some other things because we all know that COVID has changed all of our lives as well. Um, (laughs) So we wanted to (laughs) do that. um, Yeah. But with that said, um, (laughs) you know, COVID just kind of brought into light something that we've realized for a while or we're trying to figure out for a while. Um, And one of the biggest challenges is figuring out the Orlando market. It may not be the same for you guys in different cities, but Orlando is really unique. And we weren't able to really pinpoint or we still don't really know what it is about Orlando and why a shop like ours I mean, yes, we're successful, but is not as successful as what we see um, across the country from lots of stores um, and friends, brick and mortar owners across the country that we communicate with and are friends with. Orlando is very, very different. We haven't figured out what's the difference. Um, We think it might have to do with how new the pushes to shop local and really support your own town. Um, Most countries or cities across the country, like, love their cities, you know, Charleston, like they're all about Charleston and the row houses and things like that. But Orlando doesn't have that. And, and it's just now starting to get that push. So I guess the good thing is we're in it. We're in it now as it's starting to get pushed a little harder. But it, you know, we're years away from really having that local support that really other cities have. Um, So that's been a really huge challenge. Our customers love us and we're so thankful for that. Um, and our community, it's been so great. But, you know, the reach, it feels like a 
one mile radius that really we get to reach. And Orlando is huge. And we're like, why doesn't everyone know about us? And, you know, all those things that you think about as a brick and mortar owner. So that's been a really big challenge. And, you know, we're still kind of figuring out about it. Mm -hmm. I also think like, unlike some other cities, like we don't have a lot of walkable districts in uh, Orlando. So although our little area, it's called Ivanhoe Village, it's one of the main streets in Orlando. It is growing and there's like um, apartment buildings coming up, really cool, like open urban spaces that they're building in the area. But with that said, we don't have a super walkable street. It is still, we still consider Paper Goat Post a destination store where someone knows they have found us either through word of mouth or Google search or some search, and they know what, that they're coming to see us for a specific reason. And so we, Unlike, you know, someone who may be in a little walkable street that just gets a lot of walkable stumbled by people, uh, we don't really get that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I will say like living in Orlando, I understand exactly what you mean because it's like (laughs) all the little walkable cute shopping areas are just, there's like a bunch of them, but they're all spread out and they all have such a different feel. It's like very, there's not like oh, let's go to the downtown walkable place. Like there's not that. It's all no, like little no. very niche areas that you have to like kind of be in the know for. Like they all yeah. feel like very secretive. I don't know. Like Very insider. We always joke that we need to have all of our customers who kind of love our type of store hop on a bus and do a little yeah. tour to all the good ones because you I do know. have to get in your car and drive from place to place. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it is. It's like very. It's like they're all. It's like someone took the walkable downtown and then like split it up into ten little pieces and then just like <laughs> threw them out and was like, all right, here you go. Yes. Like it's very weird. So I, I understand your struggle on that. Like it's, but it, it's something you ne- not necessarily would have would have thought of. You know, at the beginning. You know, no, so we sure. just yeah like, compared ourselves to other cities that we traveled and loved their yeah. shops and areas and we're like, okay, we'll do it here and they're like wait Orlando's not like that <laughs> no but it, it, there is that m- more push for local like that is definitely I feel like in the last year or two it just started to kind of pick up like seeing more local makers and people getting really yeah. excited over local buying local and being pumped about the city finally so it's it's cool to see that that change so you guys are going to be like ready to go like when that just like takes yes. off it's gonna be gangbusters we're ready for it we yes. hope we've worked out our kinks before. yes <laughs> with that said you know we've another challenge is really just pivoting and pivoting correctly or as best as we can throughout the five years so when we first opened like our tagline was paper events gifts like that was our tagline on our logo on our door. Um, and we've changed that since then. It just says paper and party now. Um, and really taking those challenges and shifting to what Orlando needed and what um, was missing as we opened and then a lot more independent gift shops opened in the relative area. We knew that we wanted to kind of step away from that tagline that was on our door. Um, and, uh, Uh, focus a little bit more heavily on paper and party. Um, We also, you know, being in the event industry for 15 plus years or so, um, we (laughs) knew what events were and events meant a lot of things, but the general public did not know that. And we, you know, that was a fail on our part at the beginning. Party people get like they know how to party, um, <laughs> but having an event was um, kind of a foreign term to them. Yeah, so they don't, you know, you're designing wedding invitations, and they're not considering their wedding an invitation an or event. a wedding, their wedding, yeah, an event. But that's what we term. That's the technical term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was uh, another challenge, and then of course finding good people. I know you guys have talked about like assistance and staffing and labor and all those things, finding good people is a huge challenge, even to this day, especially because we, we actually don't staff part time people or other full time people. We just have a very on call team, Um, our team William, um, that we call them. So uh, they pick up hours when we both need to be off or something is going on. Um, So that very on call team William has been really hard to staff um, well. And keep it staffed with people that convey your brand and have similar passion um, that you have. And if you're wondering who William is, it's our fictitious goat in our logo. So that's why. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> like, why <laughs> Team William? <laughs> I, I did know the goat, but I was like, I hope they're going to explain the goat because maybe no one will know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. So, and then in terms of COVID, of course, the invitation business is just kind of yes. right now. Yeah. Uh, so, I know that's been a hit for you guys, which really sucks. <laughs> yeah. We're, t- I mean, we're, We are a brick and mortar location, which is super fun, especially for invitations. We're one of the only brick and mortar locations that you can walk into and buy invitations and stationary. So that's super exciting. However, that's 75 to 80% of our business, I would say. The retail actual like gifts and products is a lot less um, as far as um, revenue streams. So when COVID hit and events and weddings stopped, we definitely had to shift and really push the store and our balloon bar and all of the other things um, really hard. And that, you know, we've been working harder this year than we ever probably have mm-hmm. um, trying to stay on top of things and change and make sure we're communicating all the things we have to offer, not just invitations and stationery. Yeah. Do you think that like pushing those other things has led to some growth in that area? I mean, I know it's like a weird year and you can't really judge any of that, but just like getting your name out there and people understanding more of what you have to offer than maybe if they don't even need invitations. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. We hope that, you know, what we, all this effort that we put into growing that side of the business will maintain. And then when the invitation side of things picks back up and, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of it pick back up that we'll have the other side that has also grown to complement the return to where we were before on the invitation side. Yeah, I know. It's like the forced pivot is kind of, it's kind of nice in a way. I mean, it's not nice. It's the wrong word, but it does force you to get creative and take on that challenge. And, you know, if you take on it with like a positive mindset, and you're just like, all right, we're going to do this. And yeah. there are some good things that can still come out of it. So I'm glad you guys are like, you know. We now have an online shop of like a curated collection of retail stuff for everyone. So it's now that was like something we had to almost immediately put into place to just get out there to people in an easy way. Yes. And the balloon drops that you guys came up with, I thought that was <laughs> freaking brilliant. And I was like, they are wizards over there. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Um, our balloon bar has been. Um, going strong, you know, people do want to celebrate in some way. um, And we are so excited to help the community kind of still celebrate all those milestones so that things don't go missed um, when you can't be with people and actually celebrate how you used to. Send send snail mail. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Okay, so um, shifting gears a little bit, we have Lots of aspiring wholesalers in our audience, lots of um, up and up and coming greeting card shops. Um, can you offer some insight on what you look for when you're ordering from a new line or what type of products um, slash style you gravitate toward? Yes. So we we always look for something that's unique. I mean, we see we get lots of emails, lots of, you know, mail with like catalog samples, like all kinds of things all the time. But when we see something unique that doesn't really look like another maker, uh, just kind of stands out, like that's really where we gravitate towards and take a double take on and really look at and see if it matches our philosophies and if it's something we want to bring in. Um, And then going back to the inventory thing, like we, with the wholesalers, there's lots of lines that come across our our, you know, doorstep that Mm -hmm. we may want to have like those unique ones, but we keep a running list of kind of what, um, which ones we like, and we'll go back to them. Like we can't always bring them in right then. But those ones that are unique are really the ones that stay on that list for as long as we can go until we can actually put them and afford to open an order with them and bring them into the shop. So I'd say that is like one of the biggest things And a little bit of like knowing the small maker behind the wholesale line is kind of key too. like we've kind of stayed away from some of the larger like big brand, I guess, like it's kind of funny, like a big brand wholesaler. (laughs) We like the small independent um, makers. For example, like Kate Spade has awesome paper products and um, stationery and celebratory products. Um, 
but to us, like, we just don't want that name brand. Like we're, we don't want the big logos and, you know, we're those kind of people that we really want to keep it unique and more local feel, even if some of the lines are a bigger brand per se, um, it has that feel that it feels like us. And something we can have a conversation with our customer about, um, about the line and the story behind the line and a little bit of what went into making that card or um, product that's in our store goes way, way yeah, longer we, than I mean, when people are picking up the, the baddie Halloween card, Cami. <laughs> I always get to say <laughs> that's a local maker. That's a local yes. artist. And they're so excited for that. Um, not only do they love the card, but now they have this even better experience um, that they're supporting two small brands um, locally here in Orlando. So um, it's really exciting for us. We have um, little orange stickers that are scattered throughout products in our store that indicate that they're a Florida maker. So we have little tools like that, that we get to communicate some of those fun tips with our, our customers as they shop some of those products. Yeah. And that just speaks to the buyer's experience too, because people do want to find that like cool, unique thing, not just something they could get at like a department store, you know, like it's it's very cool that you have the independent makers. And, and I agree, like when I'm shopping too, I prefer to buy like something that maybe no one's ever heard of this brand yet, or they're just like up and coming or, or newer. So I think that's really cool that you, that you offer that. And yeah, you're right. Like having that story to connect with the, with your buyer too, and like have that conversation is, is huge. I'm sure. Yeah, but for sure. And we we also have a funny um when we're looking at new lines to bring into the store, we have a funny like MNC veto rule where if either one of us says absolutely no to a product line or an, a specific product within a line, um we <laughs> we just say no and that like stops the conversation. Like it's not <laughs> it's the product is taken off the table, it either just for some reason does not speak to one of us and we we allow that to that rule to kind of that is amazing (laughs) yeah every everything that's in the store uh, we really have thought hard about why it's in the store and how our customer is gonna use it and gift it so we really think hard about that stuff so if we know like I just don't think this is right. Like we just say no and and then we move on. <laughs> I'd say that's a good thing to a good note for aspiring wholesale art um, people is that a product mix that is wide and vast is more appealing to us as a retailer because we can buy, you know, like I'll use Kimmy's uh, line, for example, we can buy now like your stir sticks and pencils and cards and now the placemats, you know, like all these different things within your one line, we can per- make a, a big purchase and then keep keep that all in the shop versus having to find like a ton of different makers to give us that same collection. Yeah. And um, that's, I'm really glad you guys said that. <laughs> well, one, it makes it feel very validated because I've been working really <laughs> hard on like adding depth to my line, like not only yes. in different product categories, but keeping things really deep. So there's like you know, lots of choices to choose from. So you're mm-hmm. not like trying to meet, reach the, reach the minimum order amount with like five greeting cards, because that's like, yes. that's really hard. <laughs> you have to buy, buy the whole line basically. Um, yes. So what are some of the things you see that you're just like, oh, this is definitely a no. Uh, let's just have yeah. some tough love. <laughs> um, so yeah. It almost happened with something that we just purchased, but I think I got to convince Megan mm-hmm. that it was okay. Um, <laughs> but we just ordered, I don't know if you saw, oh, if you yeah. follow us, you saw them. Yes. Um, this is, this the, is the squishable, like big stuffed animals that are kind of those like kawaii or oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, little, yeah. So we got pumpkin spice, um, stuffed animal essentially um <laughs> and avocado toast stuffed animals um which oh, I, saw those. That's <laughs> um, so cute. I love and it was like a huge yes for me and I've seen them um in other stores and I just love them and Megan was like no <laughs> yeah for years or for a while I've been a big no on those but then <laughs> you know finally I saw that that could actually complement some lines that we have and you can gift those in an elevated way to really, you know, pair with something fun. We love to like tell a story, like get a card that matches the gift that kind of matches the gift wrap and just tell this whole story with why they're gifting something to someone. So 
there's fun ways. And like the avocado toast, like we love farm and house here locally that has the best avocado toast. We're like, oh, that'd be if you have to give a gift card of some sort, like that'd be such a fun thing to pair with it. You know, so there are ways to to elevate <laughs> it now and I've not just look like a cheesy, <laughs> big, large stuffed animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I almost feel like how you present something and package it or like curate mm-hmm. it with something else, like makes the sale. Like I, I'm just yes. noticing, you know, the things I've been doing with like bundle boxes and party packs and like being like, this matches with this. People are like, oh, I get it now. And like, I see that all the time. Like I can look at something and be like, oh, that would look cute together. Yes. But you know, other we- people don't have that visual to do that. But you guys... You guys are so good at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you you know, even with your products on like a wholesale side, um, you have to be able to show your buyer why they need the products and how it will work for them because not everyone gets it. And even our customers that come in, like they just see a lot of stuff and sometimes they need the help to like pull it all together. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it goes same for the wholesale side um, that you really want to uh, show them how to use everything. <laughs> Yeah, that's some great insight for sure. Okay, let's take a really quick break um, and we'll be right back. Just one second. Y'all know we are big on protecting your booty and your biz. So we want to tell you all about our secret weapon for mailing invitations for your clients, the USPS mailing agreement. It takes the personal emotions out of stressful situations and lets your clients know exactly what will happen when their invitations go out the door and it covers you in case anything goes wrong, which let's be honest, it probably will. I mean, we love you USPS, but you cry, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, we've kind of realized that putting a small shipping clause in your contract just isn't enough. Trust us, we know from experience, there are just too many things that can go wrong when mailing things like ripped flaps, scuffs and scratches, mishandled envelopes, postage snafus, lost invitations never to be seen again, and rabbit overprotective dogs. Okay, that well, one's a little bit of a stretch a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Calm a down. little okay. bit. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the point is, all of these are things that you cannot control. So why leave the burden of fate up to the United States Postal Service? Protect yourself with our mailing agreement so your client understands exactly what could happen to their invitations in the mail and how those situations are handled. If you've been scared to mail on behalf of your clients, this is the tool you need to add that next level service to your stationary biz. Go to bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash shop to purchase your copy today at 97 bucks. This is a steal. Seriously, you can't live without it. It's true. Go get it now. Okay, we're back. <laughs> I have to make that funny little noise, you guys. Okay. Um, okay, do you guys have any other um, insight you want to talk about with products and style you love? Or should we move on to talk about some other things? Just wanted to make sure you got all your yeah, stuff out there. Yeah, I think, I think um, we're good. I think there's one thing um, with pitching to a retail store is we get a lot of like emails or just almost like cold calls to us. Like it's the first time we're hearing from someone. But uh, really as a wholesale line, like take the effort to learn about who you're sending that email to, you know, change, change, make sure the fonts in your email, like everything is all the same, not just like the name being a different font. That's like oh, a, key, gosh. a <laughs> key like thing to us that you just used a template, which is fine. Like we use, you know, in Dubsado, you can make template emails. It's totally fine, but add a little line in there that is personalized to the store that you're sending it to. So those little things go a long way and you are really do get noticed for someone who um, actually sends an email to us. Yeah. yeah. So as a store owner, you would prefer to be emailed in a very like personalized way versus like someone just coming in and being like, look at my stuff or calling you. Like, is that Is that the preferred method? (laughs) I think so. Um, You know, we always love to meet people and talk to people. So that's great too. However, you know, we, it's just myself most of the time at our brick and mortar store. And a lot of small businesses are just busy with their own to-do list for the day and working with customers. So an email is something that they can do on their own time versus, you know, a phone call or showing up. Um, They have to stop what they're doing to, take that moment. And sometimes it can make it make them frustrated versus, you know, starting out on the right foot in a positive note. So I definitely think that emails are great. And really sending not just an email, but an email that shows your brand and your product. So like an introduction email without links or uh, graphics or anything like that to your actual products 
isn't really helpful because I'm not really going to say thanks for the email. Can you now send me more information? Like that's just a lot of work to be quite honest when you have a ton going on and sending those graphics that are really easy to read and see and convey your product lines, especially for cards and for all of the stationers out there you know, words on cards are small. So um, when you send a catalog or a line sheet or something like that, you want to be able to read those cards and really see what they are um, easily and clearly as well. Yeah, that's good advice for sure. Um, So like following along the same kind of train of thought, what are your thoughts on on unfair now that it's like as a buyer? Mm -hmm. Um, Because that's literally how I've been running my wholesale side. I still haven't made a catalog because I'm I don't know why, but actually I do know why, but I think it's great. It's a great tool for small wholesalers who don't really have the capacity to do a lot of the things that, um, you know, some of the bigger wholesalers do. It's a love hate relationship as well. They've built in a lot of great tools like zip code protection and things like that, um, which is nice. However, with fair, we find that everyone's finding the same stuff now. Um, you know, mm, we're going into yeah. stores in Orlando and seeing products that we have or other stores have that overlap um, a lot more than we ever have. And I do think it's because we're all on the same platform versus using all the different avenues to uh, shop. And unfortunately, like we haven't this year been able to travel much, um, but that's how we used to find a lot of our products by traveling to other cities and looking and see what what's out there, um, not just in the catalog or the the markets because we're all doing that. So we kind of found stuff like in a more unique way or really going into that Instagram rabbit hole of (laughs) where's that product from um, as well. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, since there's like no trade shows anymore, it's kind of just like changing the landscape. I mean, I just saw New York now was canceled for February and it's just, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It definitely is changing the way, you know, we shop as um, a retailer, but I wouldn't say for a new wholesaler to not get on it. I think, you know, that's a a place you want to be. You know, you'll get a lot of reach and people can search keywords and you can find that one product that does match that one shop um, by just searching and, you know, it does does help. With that said, um, lower minimums for wholesalers. I know, um, you know, large orders are fantastic for, for you guys on the wholesale side, but for a small shop to be able to try a product or one or two things versus opening like a 500 or a thousand dollar order. Um, it's just not feasible for a small shop to be able to do that. So especially on fair, like sometimes we'll search just by like no minimum so that we can easily try a product or just fill that little gap of like one thing that we're looking for without having to spend, you know, hundreds of dollars in a, in a line. Um, and then most of the time we reorder and add additional products the next time. So I think that's a great to be able to be open to those lower minimums and no opening orders and specials like that, I think really help. Yeah, I literally just lowered my minimum. Uh, It was 100. I lowered it to 50 like last week because I was like, if they find me on fair and they reorder, it's lower commission for me anyway. So like they'll probably order a smaller (laughs) amount and then order a big amount. They end up loving it. So it kind of I'm like I'm cheating the system kind of, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, especially, especially now, I mean, things are weird. People don't really know what to order, how much to order for Christmas and the yes. holidays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I just want to like try to work with retailers as much as possible on that. So that's good. And to that know goes too. a long, long way. Like the people that have reached out and said, you know, we'll do whatever you need um, and we'll get it to you quickly if we can. And, you know, all those people that are bending over backwards to make things happen, we're noticing that. And, you know, those relationships that we have with our, our vendors and um, things go a long way. And those are the ones that we've ordered during the hard times and reordered versus some of the newer, the newer folks as well. Yeah. Can you give an example of a vendor who has done a really good job staying in contact with you this past year or just staying in contact in general? Like, what do you like hearing from your vendors? What do they include in emails that like really gets your attention and makes you think about them? So uh, good juju, although I... I feel bad if they're listening um, because we haven't reordered in a little while, um, but they're always like on the top of our list. They are a stationary line um, out in California. And from the first time we, we probably met them our first year going to this national stationary show and opened an order with them. Um, And from that moment on, 
they were so great about staying in touch, um, knowing what was going on in our lives, like when Kate was born or what our favorite candy was that they included in, um, in our order and, you know, like little things like that and really recognizing us when we see them at the next trade show and things like that. And And not caring and understanding if we can't order at the moment, but still building a relationship with us, even if we, you know, are trying to just rotate through a couple other product lines at the moment and know that we'll come back to you. So not just like, Oh, they haven't ordered from us. Like, like, yeah, don't give up. (laughs) We, we specifically rotate through, like, of course we have a couple like constants, but you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of uh, lines that we love. So we kind of rotate through and then come back to other ones like, oh, we haven't ordered them in a while, we'll come back. So just knowing like what buying looks like for some businesses, and knowing that not everyone has their buying game like up to speed that, you know, and perfected as well. So working with them and kind of helping them along those processes as well. Are you on like a ton of vendors email lists? Like, do you, do you feel yes. like you get overwhelmed by that? Yeah. Like what does, to I'm the so point curious we that created like. another email <laughs> account. That is yeah. our main, we have like our main shop okay. email, you know, okay. that's kind of our general inquiries and stuff. But then we had to create a whole nother email just for like the paper stationary side of business. And, you know, we've definitely created more systems like that to kind of help us manage our day to day and all the, all the things that, you know, we're such a multifaceted business, which is a tip, um, you know, is definitely no- notable for you guys as someone wanting to open a stationary shop of some sort is to make sure that your revenue streams are diverse because it will help in times like COVID. Um, but it, it also, you have to create the systems around each one of those revenue streams. Mm-hmm. Perfect. I love that. Yeah, we do get a lot of a lot of emails um, and a lot of I mean, it's always fun to get snail mail to you. So yeah. um, if you can spend the money to send a line sheet or a card or a sample, um, you know, we get it and we love it. Um, and if it's something that's great, then, you know, we will sometimes put that in the front of the list <laughs> as well. Love it. All right. So our last question for you guys today is what's your biggest piece of advice for someone who wants to open a brick and mortar store? So I know a lot of you guys listening are designers of invitation or a product line in the stationary industry. So really, when it comes to opening a brick and mortar, unlike us, we would encourage you to kind of play off of your current brand that you already have established, you already have some type of following for and really look for products and even if they're not products within stationary, you know, a beauty line or a homeware line, whatever avenue of clothing that is going to um, complement your brand, like really play up and make the store feel like your brand so that it's, it tells that story. Yeah. It, it creates that experience um, and people are familiar with it already. Um, and if you're already at a point where people love you, like they're going to keep, loving your store, even if you go into a brick and mortar location as well. Like we sometimes will just buy a product that's black and white with pops of color because that's our brand. Um, and it stands out to us and, you know, we'll pull in a lime, like our loom candles and, um, perfume rollers. They have fantastic packaging with black and white and pops of colors. So, you know, that definitely stood out to us. So really keeping that in mind, um, as you open, we kind of, <laughs> brainstormed about Cammy's products and like what would that look like if she opened yeah. a store and um if you're familiar with like the jelly cat stuffed animal line that's like fantastic yeah. <laughs> um I feel like there's a ton of great jelly cats out there that are like those softer uh watercolory colors but yet they're like really quirky characters um kind of punny a little bit and I feel like yes. that is a great kind of product that would match perfect with Cammy's um product line as well as far as like a different category as well you guys said that it like black and white and pops of color so uh the first person i thought of was kitty meow do you know who that is <laughs> yes, yes, yes yes we have yes. we have we have some of her cards um yeah in the shop yeah. okay that's what i was wondering because i was like yeah. that was like literally the first person that fell in my brain when you said that so i didn't want it to be like <laughs> awkward and be like no but i kind of figured i probably did <laughs> Yeah, there's also right now, like the feel of our store, um, the girl with the knife uh, Mm -hmm. line of. Oh, yes. Yes. (laughs) Like those are also very fitting. And then there's a 
Um, Ginger pea is also another line that really just like feels like us. Like if we, if we were designing cards, I'd design them like that. <laughs> Does she have the big pink barn building? Yes. That- yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so cute. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I know. I'm like, I want a giant pink barn in my backyard. Yes. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And then really we, um, just to add on that, um, as far as advice, I wish we had a little bit more of this when we first started, but finding those friends and mentors not necessarily super close to you. So we found some really great and lasting friendships and relationships um, with other shop owners across the country that are just so helpful. And you're in that same business, but yet not in the competitive world. You know, we are across the country. So we're not, we can talk about something and be open and honest about it. And we're not feeling like we're competing with each other. Um, So finding those folks and those networks and those groups um, has been really important to us and really helped us when we were in a bind and we needed to sound a question off someone. Yeah. We get a handful of emails or I'd say throughout the year, like here and there, we get people who ask us, about opening the shop and we would love to, you know, if anyone has questions for us, like we're, we're super, super transparent about our business. Um, It only helps someone else. If even, even within our market, you know, we do meet up with other retailers locally and just, you know, talk about things because if you're transparent with your business, it just kind of puts the good vibes out there. Our customers kind of feel that and just know that we're honest and hardworking and that's part of our brand. Love it. That's such great advice. Yes. Okay. I feel like we've wrapped up and I just want to say <laughs> you guys are amazing. You have so much, so much insight to share and you just have like the sweetest hearts and I just love it so much. And <laughs> I just you. want you to let everyone know um, where they can find you and how they can shop all the fun products from Paper Goat Post too. Yes. So definitely check out papergoatpost.com, um, our website and really dive into it. There's a lot of different things on there. Sign up for our email list. We only send our newsletter when something really fun or important is going on. So we're not going to spam you with lots of uh, newsletters. So sign up there and follow us on um, Instagram at Paper Goat Post. We would love to uh, see you guys all there as well. Yes. Thank you, guys. I have learned so much from just like listening to you. I've been soaking all of it up. I don't do as much of the the products as Cami does, but I learned a ton and I'm sure our audience did too. Our audience is going to freak out over this. <laughs> yeah. If anyone has questions, like for real, <laughs> send us a message and say that you heard us on here. Um, and we are more than glad to hop on a call with you or just chat about, you know, business life. Um We love that as well. Um, It's part of the reason why we do this, that we can kind of share our experiences. Not that we're experts by any means, but, you know, we have definitely learned some stuff over the five years. So um, email us as well at hello at papergoatpost.com. Or send them some snail mail, you guys. Just write them a letter. Put them in a cute (laughs) card. They'll love it. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This was just great. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. us. (laughs) All right. I'll talk to you guys later. I'll probably send an email later. I got to show you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.